Welcome back. Richard, it's good to see you. Hey, good morning. Happy uh, whatever it is, mid-month. It, it is mid-month, but it's also, uh, you know, many schools are starting summer vacation already. It's already mm -hmm. the end of the school year. So, um, yeah. and we're going to talk about some of that today. We're going to, we're, we're actually going to continue our conversation from last week where we were talking about you know, sort of the consequences and, and the psychology of, of, of hate and, and anger. Um, but we're going to talk about schools today because, you know, we work with a lot of teachers. Uh, we work with a lot of students and we work with a lot of schools in general. And um, there's a there's a lot of challenges happening in schools right now, wouldn't you say? Yeah, there are. And, um, you know, summertime, summertime gives us a, a little bit of a pause to sort of take our breath and say, okay, we're so busy during the school year just trying to manage everything that you don't have time to get to really get perspective. And so the summer summer vacation gives everybody, parents, teachers, uh, students, everybody, a chance to sort of sit back and get a little bit of perspective. And you're right, there is a lot happening in education today. Um, this is an election year coming up, uh, presidential election in 2024. That always stirs the pot a little bit. And one of the issues that's really percolating to the surface is what's going on in our schools, public and private. Some of it is alarming. Um, book bans, um, critical race theory, don't say gay, banning woke, and all the other prohibitions. These are things that are prohibited now in many states. Um, and that's always sad. And it's alarming to us when people who really don't, and I don't mean to be overly critical here, but most people don't really understand what it's like to be in a classroom because most of us are not teachers. So people who don't understand or don't know much about education decide that they know enough to control what is being taught or what students are being allowed to read. Um, right. And that's kind of the antithesis of what education should be. Um, education should expand your thinking, help you to think critically, uh, make us aware of other people's struggles. Um, I, it's important for me as, a, as an informed citizen to know what my fellow citizens are going through. Um, I know what my experience is. I don't know what it's like to be poor or to be a minority, but it's important that I understand that and education is one of the ways for me to become aware of that. Okay. Right. Absolutely. And, and, you know, the, that, that's the, that, that's sort of the crux of working and living in a society, right? Is that we 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 work and do our best. We, we will never fully we will never fully appreciate the Absolutely. the challenges and lives of other people. But we want mm -hmm. to do that um, what we can to to try to understand, to try to meet them where they are. And and it's but it's only as you said through having that information that we right. can make informed decisions. You know. Right. Mm -hmm. If if we only make decisions that are in our own best interest, or, or only in the best interest of people who who look and live like us, then we're omitting, and, and you know, and sometimes the cases we're we're kind of working against lots mm -hmm. of other people. That's right. We live in a multi ethnic culture. Our our culture is a melting pot. We've always talked about that. And so we have challenges that many other countries don't have, who, who aren't don't have that melting pot tradition. And you need information uh, to make informed decisions. We we want, you know, why do we have public schools? Because in in shortly after the the uh, country was founded, it was decided that we needed to educate people if they were going to be educated citizens and educated voters. So you need information. And so to be told that you can have this information, but you can't have this information, or you can read this book, but you can't read that book, is really a frightening um, prospect. Because people talk about, well, we don't want to indoctrinate. There's a, there's a great deal of conversation currently in Florida about children are being indoctrinated. Indoctrination doesn't occur because you have information indoctrination occurs when you limit that information because then you're trying to provide this information but not this information right. and and education should provide information and young students should be um 
taught how to handle that information. You know, that you're going to have conflicting views, but this is how you handle conflicting views. You don't eliminate one of the views. Right. It, it, the, the information should be provided on both sides of an issue. That's um, right. And so that a person can, you know, this is what critical thinking is, is you, you mm -hmm. have information on both sides and you, you work through the process of what you believe and what you understand and, and how, how you think about things. And, you know, in the midst of all of these these challenges, you, you mentioned, you, you know, the book banning and, and critical race theory and gender identity, all, all these other things. Mm -hmm. What's really happening at, at the at the classroom level, you know, certainly those issues are affecting the classroom um, levels at the classroom levels because we have we have librarians or media specialists sure. who are you know having to get rid of thousands of books out of the school library and, and teachers aren't able to have in, in many schools teachers aren't able to have even classroom libraries you know book right. cases with with books that the students can check out mm -hmm. teachers aren't able and able to do that but what's really happening that seems to be at, at, at the at the forefront of a, a lot of teachers uh, minds is this issue with students and their participation or, or what many teachers are referring to as disrespect, mm -hmm. um, but their behavior in the classroom and how they're approaching their education, this really seems to be a big issue right now. Right, from parents and teachers. You know, many, right. many parents are coming to, my child won't do his work or he's mm -hmm. he's he's copying other people's homework or he's he's not going to class or he's not paying attention or he's not turning in assignments. And this is typically seen as defiance or disobedience, okay? Mm -hmm. um, there was a, 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 a clip this morning on, on, on one of the websites that uh, the primary concern of Tennessee teachers for the coming school year is student discipline. Right. Well, is it, we tend to think of this as defiance and disobedience, but when we try to uh, try to figure out why students are behaving the way they are, we are again confronted with one of our complex issues. And complex right. issues, complex problems, typically require um, complex solutions. There's no easy, you know, people say, well, we should have, we, we should have, we should have paddling, or we should have prayer, or we should have this, or we should have that. There is no single solution mm -hmm. for how children are approaching their learning and behavior in classrooms today. A absolutely. And um, it, it, there, there's, we talked about that last week, that, you know, these are issues that have complex um, ideologies. They, they come from, you know, very complex um, circumstances. Right. And so they're going to have equally complex solutions. I mean, it, it's, it's almost mathematical, right? It, you can't have a really difficult problem and a very simple solution. It just typically right. doesn't work that way. Right. And so the, as we see it, you know, over, over the course of the week or more that we've been thinking and, and talking about this, we have sort of, it, it seems to us at least that this comes from at least four forces, or it, it's a consequence of four different forces. And, and the first one we think began actually a few decades ago, right? Yeah. Yeah, now it in, has been. In, in 2001, um, President uh, George W. Bush um, proposed and, and, and Congress pushed through the um, No Child Left Behind bill. Right. Um, and, and, you know, it was a great idea on the surface, but what it said was that, um, I, I mean, the, the sort of highlight, the, the marquee statement was that every student will read at grade level by third grade. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And... and what that all whittled down to is that's where we came up with this idea of high stakes testing. And um, every state, every school district now tests its students on a on, on a regular basis, at least yearly. Um, here in Florida, we're doing it now three times a year, um, testing students to see where they are on these nationally um, comparable types of tests to look at reading, especially reading, but also reading and math. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and, and again, while on the surface, that looks like a like it could be a good idea. It has had significant effects that have that that we're now starting, I think, to 
to really realize. Um, and, and that is the, the statement that many parents have heard um, and that many students are very aware of. And right. that's the idea of teaching to the test. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we learned in the 90s, we learned that if kids aren't reading at grade level by third grade, they don't catch up. So the idea was, well, then let's make sure they're reading at grade level. Let's do whatever we can. Sounded like a good idea. But what happened was, it was the measurement was this single test that was right. given sometime after March, usually in April or May, you would give this very um, important measurement. And if students weren't reading at grade level, they would be retained. So the, the stakes were very high and these things became known as high stakes tests. Well, so it, it was just, not just high for the students for that reason. Exactly. But they were high for the teachers as well, the teachers right. in the schools, because teacher evaluations, mm -hmm. you know, a teacher's effectiveness was, right. was critically tied to mm -hmm. how well his or her students did. That's right. And not only the teacher, but the but the school you know, did this school. And then so then the administration got drawn into this. So here you have this measurement, the single test, and we're going to judge student progress, teacher effectiveness and administrators effectiveness based on the scores on these end of year tests. That's why they're called high stakes. They're, they're great. There was a great deal of emphasis put on these. And when you when you have a single measurement that becomes that important, it's understandable why the emphasis would shift to the most important component of a school year, which was your students' test scores. Right. So so with this idea, you know, the, the teachers, sometimes teachers were told very directly, and sometimes it was more indirect right. that they were to focus on the information that would be present on the tests. And so this is where we came to the to the reality that many elementary schools um, did away with arts programs. Many elementary schools did away with things like recess and That's right. uh, you know students when when most of us were in schools, um, you know we had PE every day, but you know now they have it only two or three times a day, uh, right. two or three times a week now. Right. Um, and, and again, some schools don't even have art or music or anything like that because, um, and that doesn't even include where some schools got rid of things like science and social and studies because they weren't being tested for them. That's right. And, and you under, and you can bet that if, if my student, if I'm going to be evaluated, if I'm, a, and I'm going to be evaluated based on this information, then that's the information I'm going to be teaching. I'm not going to waste my time doing anything else. I'm going to make sure I get this done. Okay, right. so so it, it since 2001, so we're talking about t over 20 years, right. but we have a generation of students who grew up being taught mm -hmm. that you only need to know this. This is what's important, and if you if you're good at this, right, everything will be okay. So education narrowed to a list of to a set of testable questions, right. So not only not only did the students get that message that this is all this is all that's important. Science isn't important. Social studies isn't important. Art, music, pe those things are not important. What's important are these these skills that you have to regurgitate at the end of the year. The second thing it did is it made it it was very difficult to test complex issues. Right. So you could have factual questions about the war between the states you know who was the president of the confederacy who was the president of the union who was this general what was this battle but it was very difficult to test things like why did the war occur in the first place because that's a complex issue that you can't reduce to a couple of questions right. so complicated issues like causes weren't included in the curriculum because again they weren't going to be tested so right. why bother teaching them? You had to spend your time teaching what was going to be on the test. A absolutely. And so, you know, you you have this, the, these complicated um, facts or, or these complicated um, circumstances like wars or, um, you know, political decisions, you know, the Great Depression and all right. of these things. Mm -hmm. With history, you, you have all these complicated things, but they have to be whittled down to fact-based questions that could be 
multiple choice. But on a multiple you know? choice test. Right. So, you know, and, and again, students realize this either either because they were directly told, you know, you don't need to know that information, or they just you know, intuitively figured it out, like, well, you know, as long as I know the dates, and I know these people's names, I'm going to be okay right. in the test, you know, students can figure that out pretty quickly. So we have, you know, that sort of set the stage for what then came as sort of a the second uh, force that we see um, as as contributing to where we are. And that is, of course, the uh, again, over the past 20 years, especially the right, significant, exactly. um, uh, you know, the explosive availability of information through the internet and especially YouTube. That's right. Those things have ch completely changed the way that students see information. That's right. How they, how the, what information they want and how they get, how they get that information. Okay. Because right. there was a time when you had to get it from the teacher. The mm -hmm. teacher had the information and it was funneled down to students. At about the same time that No Child Left Behind arrived, the internet arrived. I mean, the internet generation is anybody born after 1995. So right. the, it, it's the same time period that you have this change in education to this is all you need to learn. And the second one was, this is another way to learn it. This is another way to get information. Yeah, absolutely. And and for, for many of us, like, if if we just stick with YouTube, for example, it, it is what we wanted for the 21st century, right? Yeah. Anything you want to know, wh whether it's, you know, how to change the oil in some antique car that you've never had before, you know, <laughs> that you know, three people in the world have, or, right. um, or, or if it's, you know, how gravity works, mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. do a Google search um, or a YouTube search, and there's going to be, there, you know, you, you can be pretty confident that there's going to be a YouTube video that shows you how to do it. And I remember the first time my kid said, dad, just Google it. And I said, right. what? <laughs> just what? And they said, yeah, just Google it. It's up there somewhere, you know? Yeah. And it is. They were right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if I'm having a hard time with my kid as they're trying to learn, you know, why gravity works, yeah, right. Right. I can sit there and I can struggle with them for hours in the evening, only making us both frustrated. Or we can go to YouTube and have Neil deGrasse, Neil deGrasse Tyson or, you know, Crash Course or somebody like that show a, a 10 minute video that has all these beautiful graphics and, and you know, computer generated uh, examples of these things. And, and there you go. That's how gravity works, you know. And, and so YouTube and, and the Internet in general has completely changed the way that kids get information because they know that anything that they want to know. It's a Google search, it, it, and it's right there. That's right. So if you combine one and two, if you combine this is all you need to know, and here's a very efficient way to get it, you can see why students are no longer invested in traditional classroom education that we had for centuries, that right. we had until the until the year 2000. I mean, so instead, students are not interested in a whole course. They're interested in getting specific information presented in a very brief, uh, condensed, and usually more entertaining format. I mean, why sit through a boring lecture listening when you can go on the internet and see the, see these graphics and get a, a complete explanation in just a couple of minutes? Much more efficient. A absolutely. Now, now, the third and, and fourth forces seem to They're are not. sometimes right. kind of tied together. Um, right. And, and you know we are certainly not here to to blame everything on the pandemic um, yeah. that started in you know early to, 2020 mm -hmm. um, because some of this stuff was present before then you know prior sure. just prior mm -hmm. to the pandemic the thinking about here in Florida specifically there began this uh, process where students who were having difficulty you know if if it was getting near the end of their the uh, assessment quarter. Um, and they were failing a class that teachers and, and schools in general had to provide them some type of grade recovery process. And there right. was these policies mm -hmm. in place that said, if your students fa failing as you approach the end of the quarter, that the students could be given some kind of packet or um, material so that they could improve their grade so that they could pass. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
you know, again, you can see that, well, maybe this is a good idea because, um, well, there may be lots of reasons why the student didn't do well throughout the th throughout the quarter. And so giving them the opportunity to, to improve their grade, that's going to be that's a great way to, you know, support the student who's having some issues that are outside of their control. If they became homeless or they became, you know, some some, some there was a death in the family or something. It, that's great. How, however, again, um, this has had significant unintended consequences as it has expanded. And again, especially with the, over the, through the course of the pandemic, it has expanded significantly with this idea that, you know, students learn, you know, well, I don't really have to do a whole lot for the first right. eight weeks of the quarter. And mm -hmm. that last week, they're going to give me something so that I can make it up. That's right. I remember when the Department of Education, through the legislature, I mean, it's a law now, when they first promulgated this idea of grade recovery, I can remember teachers saying, well, a lot of students aren't going to do anything until the end, and then they'll do the packet. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, I've had I've had um, youngsters say to me, teenagers say, well, no, I'm not going to do the I'm not going to do all these assignments now. I'll just wait until the end. They'll give me a packet and I'll do it in the for last couple of days of the of the grading period. And so what what do very smart students do? They say, well, I don't need to do this because I'll get rescued in the end. And right. when we say there are no consequences, this is one of those issues. The unintended consequence here is that students don't feel pressure to do anything. It was a great idea. I mean, the, the idea of grade recovery is you can take a student who's failing and it gives them a chance to pull it out at the end. Mm -hmm. But it also creates this other consequence of, well, I'm not going to do anything. I'll just do all the work at the end. And the teacher can give me a packet and I'll go in the principal's office and I'll finish it on the last day and I'll still pass the course. A absolutely. So, so with the with the pandemic you know we again this was this was especially used then because you know what we learned early on in the pandemic is that when when students were at home there's a surprisingly right. large number and, and if you ever seen any of the graphics that sort mm -hmm. of break the US population down to right. 100 people and you can see the percentages of of different things you you can see it there but you don't really think about it until you are working in schools and, and you come to the realization of how many uh, students don't have internet at home. Right. And don't so computers. Right. So, so they're left, they, they, they can't come to school because of the pandemic. And so they have to stay at home. Well, if they don't have internet at home, if they don't have computers at home and, you know, yes, um, we can do a lot of things with our phones, Mm -hmm. But my goodness, to try to learn algebra on your iPhone, it that yeah. isn't going to be very effective. That's right. So, so if you don't have internet at home and you don't have access to things, things have to be sort of whittled down to the bare bones of, of what right. students need to know mm -hmm. um, and what they need to know for the test and what they need to know to pass the class. And, and the pandemic brought that into full light. You know, it, it it made that a very stark realization that, you know, much of what you do in seven and a half hours a day at school can be done in just a couple of hours at home. Right. That, that's what the pandemic taught us is that when they, these kids all went home, they could finish the work in a couple of hours. And, and suddenly everybody was aware that, wow, I can do this online in two or three hours. Why should I go sit in a classroom for seven? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so again, we're not trying to blame everything on, on COVID-19, but it, it, it gave students a very uh, different reality right. um, than what was present before. Um, yes, students were able to do grade recovery and some of those kinds of things before, but with the onset of the pandemic, you know, school districts very directly said, you know, we're not going to fail students. We're not going to let them fail simply because they have to stay home. Right. We're going to, we're going to make these accommodations. We're going to make, we're going to have this grace and mercy. We're going to do these things to make sure that students pass and right. students embrace that with, That's right. uh, with more vigor, I think, than, than we had hoped that they would. And they have maintained that. That's so right. everybody's trying to get back to normal, mm -hmm. 
you know, they're they're trying to we're trying to go back to the way things were in 2019. Right. And students aren't the same as they were in 2019. That's what and they were changing even before that. Yeah. I mean, all these forces, all these forces were at work before the pandemic. I think the pandemic simply accentuated or accelerated what was already beginning to occur. And Absolutely. and so you, when and you, when you think about these four forces, high stakes testing, the internet, grade recovery, and the pandemic, they've created a very very different educational landscape. Mm -hmm. um, and it's especially difficult for teachers because when students don't do their work, parents and teachers, mm -hmm. when students don't do their work, when they don't turn in assignments, when they're spending time online. It's natural for parents and teachers to see this as a lack of effort or non-compliance or disrespect. I mean, that's that's a natural reaction, okay? Yeah. But I think we need to think beyond defiance, disobedience, and disrespect and talk about how these forces have, have combined to create a very different educational landscape, but also to create a very different attitude in our students. And it's not anti-teacher or anti-parent. Mm -hmm. It's that they have a very different approach to how they want to get the information that they feel is important. A absolutely. And I, and I, th I think what um, the thing that we should be most concerned about, um, and I'll be, I'll be careful here, Dr. Marshall, not to, not to go off into. You do, you do, you, you warn me every week not to do this, and then very, then you slide into this at the end. I, I know, but when you turn the news on, and when you read the paper, or, or you read, you know, Google News or whatever you read, um, you hear about all of these other issues in education, right? And you know, by other issues, people, you mean critical race theory. Quote, and rate, yeah, right. right. Critical race theory and, and being woke is not affecting my kid in algebra one. <laughs> right. Right. You know, all of the these other issues are these issues that we're talking about, these four forces that we're talking about today, those right. things are their, their behavior in school, the way that those we're we're managing students, the way that parents are, are managing their students, and the way that teachers are managing the students, those things are affecting the students ground ground floor you know that right. that is that is the fundamental issue that we're having right we're spending so much time talking about these things that are not issues right these are mm -hmm. not problems in in public education that's right we're talking right. about them as though they are we're presenting them as though they are we're we're making people believe that they are but they're right. not right. when you go to a school and you see that they're taking out you know a 2000 books out of their their library mm -hmm. and then but at the same time you say you know what reading uh reading levels are, are dropping right mm -hmm. you know, they have um, students, right. students aren't reading as as much or, or as well as they were before but you know what let's take more books out of the out of the library right mm -hmm. you know <clears throat> students students aren't thinking critically and looking at you know social issues and and world related issues the way that they should you know if they want to go into politics or if they want to go into some type of helping profession where they need to understand differences you know they don't need to read about that stuff right we need to right. what we need to do is just kind of not pay attention to those i i don't understand why we are we are emphasizing and focusing so hard on some of these non-issues and not focusing on what really is the problem. What is right. really keeping students limited in what they are achieving in school mm. are these issues. Right. Like I said we're fighting about all this other mess. Right, exactly. And it detracts from what's really happening in schools. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a theme in education today about we're not going to include this um, either a book or an idea or an issue because it's it's not educational. Right. Okay? This whole thing about it has no educational value. Um, who gets to decide whether right. something has educational value or not? I don't want somebody else deciding for what's educationally relevant to me or my children. Absolutely. That's not up to somebody else. I'll decide if I want my children to read Harry Potter or um, Little House on the Prairie. That's my decision. Okay, you you want to have parents making the decisions, and then, then allow parents 
to make the decision. Don't start saying, well, you can make the decision, but you can't do this and you can't talk about this and you can't read these books. That's not, that's the slippery slope to propaganda and to indoctrination that we're only going to let you look at this stuff. That's indoctrination. That's propaganda. Right. And, and I think that, you know, we, we have to, we have to feel for our, our teachers and our educators who are doing what they can to to meet the expectations that we have for them to for for teaching our, our students and to help them you know our, our students build skills and, and knowledge and understanding of the of the world and, and different mm -hmm. um, areas, um, while at the same time dealing with you know these issues that we've talked about today related to the, the student's behavior and, and their, you know, what's seen as non-compliance and disrespect. And, and perhaps that should be our focus. Maybe we'll talk about that next week. This right. little um, spoiler alert. Um, right. Talk next week about, you know, maybe a different way to look at what we're thinking about as, as disrespect and disobedience and non-compliance. You know, maybe some, think about it in a different way that will help teachers better manage and better work with some of these students right. um, in the future yeah it's really not it may not be disrespect and defiance so we don't want to blame the students right for what is a much larger problem and it's a problem that started more than almost 25 years ago now um, yeah. all these all the seeds for what we're doing today uh, began almost 25 years ago so let's let's deal with those issues what's really going on and that has created a student who's very different. Yeah. These students are very different than students have ever been before. Absolutely. And so we need to acknowledge that reality and deal with what, with where they are and how they're viewing education because they're not viewing it in a traditional way. Right. So, yeah. And we need to acknowledge that. We need to deal with that. Uh, absolutely. Learning requires a teacher and a student. Right. Um, right. And both have to be interested and, and focused on learning. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can't, the, the teacher can't make the student learn something that the student doesn't actively find a, a, a need to learn. And right. so, um, so we'll talk about that some next week then. So okay. that is it for today. Okay. All right. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, and forget to be afraid.